This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. I am Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. And we have a super special guest who very kindly volunteered to be on the podcast today to help all of you out, including myself. Tell us who you are and what your name is. Hi, my name's Amy. I'm from Michigan, but I live here in Longmont now. I'm a writer and a traveler and a pumpkin grower and a member of the financially independent community here in town. Before we get into it, how many different kinds of pumpkins do you typically grow in a season? Oh, wow. Um, Last season, I want to say it was around 28 or 30 different kinds. Okay. They're super cool. Some of them look like UFOs. I've often thought that some of these UFO sightings might be just some kid who chucked up one of your pumpkins through the air and someone happened to take a picture of it. I think that sport actually has a name. It's called Pumpkin Chunkin. <laughs> Is that a Michigan Michigan sport? Or? Uh, I think it's more like Nebraska, Iowa, like more in the middle, but I've yeah. definitely heard about it where they use like a slingshot kind of contraptions to see how far they can launch like a jack-o'-lantern sized pumpkin, like on a football field, something like that. Wow. That's pretty awesome. I would actually like to see that. Yeah. Maybe we should do that here. I was going to say, we could organize that. We really could. Yeah. You guys build the slingshot, I'll bring the pumpkins. Let's do it. And in the in the sound check, everyone hang on all the way till the end. We talk about pumpkins quite a bit, so you can get a little detail about yeah. that stuff. Yeah. So let's get into it. We are not going to be our goofy, silly selves today because we're going to talk about a very serious topic. I alluded that Amy volunteered to be on this show to help people out. Um, Amy had a pretty tremendous tragedy in her life, but the pain didn't stop there. It got even worse. So we're going to talk about what happened to Amy and how you can avoid a similar situation. So Amy, real quickly, we're not going to dwell on this, but why don't you discuss what happened to your husband? Yeah. So my husband, Phil, um, was in a cycling accident back in September of 2021, and it was a very serious accident and he essentially died on impact. Um, There wasn't a car involved, thankfully, because if there was, like, I think there would be a lot more anger. You know, it was just sort of one of those freak things where he flew off the bike and and that's what happened. Um, And we were married for nine years and one week. It was exactly a week after our ninth wedding anniversary. And we had moved to Longmont um, less than two years prior, prior. And we had purchased a house less than a year prior. So we were sort of just getting settled here, um, and we were starting to work on our house. We had many plans for it uh, when this when this happened, and obviously that by itself is like it's a seismic, you know, geologic impact to to one's life, you know, and and not just me. Obviously, he was beloved by many people, other members of his family, Um, but something I learned in the in the sort of near aftermath of his death. was about our financial situation. And it was about uh, the fact that he and we did not have a will or trust in place. And we were then um, exposed to some some aspects of the law and and that sort of thing that, that we had no awareness of. So that's that's kind of what we're talking about today. And how old were each of you when this happened? So he was 37 and I was 39. Okay. So you're pretty young, and I fully admit it, my old ass is 49, and as silly as this is, and I have two children, so my situation is much more complex, but we don't even have a will. We're working on it now, uh, mostly due to you and your story and what we'll talk about it today, but I think, just to back up a second, I'm kind of curious, have you ever researched what percentage of people have a will at your age, or did that ever come across? I would suspect most people do not, because you don't think about this when you're young. You think, ah, I'll do that when I'm 70 and death might be a decade or two off. I don't think most people think about it when they're 30s. And I'd like you to follow up, Doug, if you thought about it um, when you were that young. 
Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Most people don't. And we were mm-hmm. definitely in that category. We had thought about it. Um, there sort of came a time in our financial independence journey where we were accumulating enough assets where I started to think like, okay, this is kind of getting borderline irresponsible of us to not have something in place. But the scenario that I imagined was that we both were killed in like a plane crash or something. We'd had many conversations about what we thought and expected would happen if just one of us dies, namely that we thought the other one would be perfectly safe. You know, we were married, so that would be fine. Um, But yeah, when you're young and you're healthy and Phil was extremely healthy, it wasn't like there was a cancer diagnosis and we had some warning and then it's like, okay, there's some health issues. This means we need to get these ducks in a row. It was such a quick um, and unexpected thing that we were really caught off guard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we thought about it a little bit in the scenario that you mentioned, Amy, where if we both died, like we would want something to happen and have a little bit of control. Uh, Of course, we didn't do shit about it um, after we thought about that for years. But because of Phil and you, Amy, like we have a will as of, you know, whatever the last six months or whatever, we finally like did it. And there's a couple of things we need to put together. There's a a few other, um, I guess, forms or some things we have to get notarized to help expedite some of the processes and stuff like that. But now we do have a will. So I'm so glad to hear that. Like, I think you're the first specific person who has been like, because of your situation, I have now changed something about my life and my planning. And so thank you for telling me that. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. I mean, yeah, like it's, it's we'll get into the details, but yeah. We uh, we finally did it. So yeah, Carl, you're you're up next. Then we are done. we are up next. I was talking to Steve, an attorney, mutual friend of all of ours, and uh, he gave me everything I need to do to get the ball in motion. So we're going to do that very very soon. But Amy, I always had the same thought as you. What happens if both of us die in an accident, a plane? Actually, the same scenario. What happens with our kids? And uh, yeah, we were just lazy and busy and never got around to it. But it mm-hmm. will be done. Very, very soon. And before we go deeper, so no kids, right? Can you lay out some of the other stuff? Were you working? Was Phil still working? Like how retired were you? And just kind of, you know, the fire aspect as well. Yeah. So we don't have kids. We were childless by choice. That was actually a big reason when we met of how we knew this was going to work because we were both on the same page about that, which Mm -hmm. at the time, like in your mid twenties and you're dating, that was actually really hard to find. Right. Um, So that, that, that's that situation. Um, Money-wise, we had reached financial independence uh, right around June of 2020. And I think it sort of ha- was one of those things that happened slowly at first, like we'd been working on it for years, but then all at once, it's like, okay, you're there. And what are you going to do with your life now? <laughs> right? So we had just moved to Longmont when this happened and I had been job searching, but then it was like, oh, okay, maybe that's no longer necessary. And so we decided that I was going to go back to school which is something that I had been thinking about doing um, with this sort of longer term goal of teaching community college English sort of throughout our retirement, where the kind of job where you can, you know, do a semester here or a semester there as an adjunct, but you're not like tied down. If you want to go traveling that year, you don't have to do anything. So that was sort of part of that plan. Um, At the time of his death, Phil was still working because when we reached that fine number, he had just started with a company Um, that he was really, really loving. And it turned out to be the kind of company and the kind of work culture and the kind of work and the kind of manager that he'd been searching for literally his entire career. So he was like, I kind of want to see where this goes and do a year or two. And, you know, I can always leave if it gets bad, but I want to, I want to see this through. So that was our situation at the time of his death. I was in school full time and he was working full time. Okay. Was he going to continue working just because he liked the job so much or? It was kind of touch and go. Like he was, he was happy that he had the choice to walk away. And I think that relieved the pressure. Like when he was having a frustrating day at work, there were a couple of coworkers that were challenging for him, uh, you know, and at cocktail hour that night, he would be like, oh, you know, so-and-so, this person really pissed me off. I mean, maybe I'm just done. And I'd be like, okay. If that's what you want. Yeah. And then usually he would just, you know, either the next day he'd go back and he'd be fine or his boss would talk him down or whatever. But um, it really kind of changed his approach to work, knowing that he could walk away at any time. And ultimately, many times over, he kept deciding, like, no, I, I really am having more fun here. 
I don't think he would have done it forever. Um, around the time of his death, we had been chatting a little about like maybe another year is how he was feeling at the time. But also that could change any day uh, if he just, you know, decided. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, every state is a little bit different, but how does Colorado treat your estate when you don't have a will? Yeah, so every state has what they call intestate succession laws or guidelines. Um, and intestate is a word that's used to describe dying without a will. So if you die without a will, you die intestate. And then your estate is subject to your, or to your state's, in this case, Colorado laws surrounding that situation. So in Colorado, there's a hierarchy. Every state has a slightly different one. They're all pretty similar. Um, but it outlines what happens if you have a spouse and children, or if you have a spouse, but no children, or if you have a spouse, no children, but you do have living parents, or if you have a spouse and children, but one of you has a child from a previous relationship. So these are all factors that can change how the state will treat your estate in the event of your death um, without a will. So in Colorado, uh, for our situation in particular, um, which is, you know, having uh, no children, but having living parents in Phil's case, what they do is the first $300,000 of your estate goes to your spouse and 75% of what remains also goes to your spouse. And that remaining 25% goes to your parents. Now, the only property or assets that are subject to this are the ones that are in your name only as the decedent, the person who dies. So anything that our names were both on, um, that just came to me automatically. It was not subject to this process. But there was one account, and it just happened to be our main largest investment account where most, most all of our after-tax investments were. And Phil had opened this account before we were married, and he did it at Charles Schwab. And we learned very early on that Schwab was just really awesome with customer service and with their interface, and they refund your ATM fees with your linked checking account, and it was just like a really nice bank. And so they became our default uh, for that reason. And we got married, and we never like went back. And you know, we did have separate finances in the early stages of our marriage. But later on, that changed. It sort of like slowly got mushed together. Um, and I'd say that happened pretty completely, you know, around like year five or six of our marriage. But we never went back and did all the paperwork. We never added each other to all the accounts. We never like just did those really basic things mm -hmm. um, that would have ensured safety in the event of one of our deaths. And so that's how we became you know, exposed to this situation at all. If he had just named you as a beneficiary on the account, would that have mitigated uh, what we're about to talk about? Yes, it absolutely would have. Um, beneficiaries, many people don't realize this, but beneficiaries actually supersede a will. So if you have a will in place and it says, you know, I want my brother Joe to get 100% of my estate, but then on this one account over here, you have your brother Dave, um, then Dave's going to get that account, even though in your will, it says that you wanted Joe to get it. Mm -hmm. Because again, that beneficiary will supersede what a will says. So in this particular case, there was actually no beneficiary named on this account. Again, it was open before we were married. So it was just one of those things. Everything else, I was specifically designated or my name was on. Right. Uh, follow up. So I have an E-Trade account which I think is similar to the account that you're talking about. So this was a post-tax brokerage account that Phil had. So in my case, I've tried to add Elizabeth as the beneficiary, but there's no beneficiary for the post-tax brokerage account. 401k, IRA, all that kind of stuff. Very easy. I could add her. But when I followed up, they were like, oh no, this is not one you could put a beneficiary on. So Oh, Check with your lawyers out there, but you may not have been able to do it. Interesting. I haven't yeah. heard that yet. Yeah. Check with your banks for sure. And it, do you know anything about that? Like, do you have a beneficiary on your brokerage account? Yeah, that's uh, interesting. You mentioned that because uh, when I was asking Amy the question, I thought the exact same thing with a 401k. It was really easy to do. And I think it was even part of the process when you initially right. sign up for it. And they might have even prompted me for it at some point. But yeah, I wonder if there's some kind of rule around there that you can't name a 
beneficiary for a post-tax account, or maybe it's, I know you could open up accounts in different ways, like uh, you could have multiple names on it, and I can't remember what that's called, but maybe whatever you designate it as when you open it, maybe you can't change it right. after that. And it must be a tax thing, since one is like tax protected and the others are, or yeah. So it must be a tax thing, but check with your accountant or whatever. This is just entertainment, not financial advice. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the first, you mentioned the first $300,000 automatically went to you. And is that the first 300 of that account or everything put together? And I guess I'll get a, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but is that everything, including the house, or does that just apply to this one particular account? Good question. So. The intestate succession rules only apply to the property um, that's part of the estate. Um, and his estate only encompassed property that was in his name only that I was not on. So like the house we held together in joint tenancy. So I just, that became mine in the event of his death. All the other accounts, the 401ks, the whatever, that all came to me or my name was already on, you know, various other types of accounts. So it was only this one account. That had that this math applied to this first three hundred thousand and and you know then the rest. Okay. And oh, sorry, Carl, did you have any follow ups with that too? No, I was going to move on to the next part. Perfect, you got it. Sure. So, as you mentioned before, after the first three hundred thousand dollars, Phil's parents can be entitled to the money. Uh, uh, yeah, please discuss as little or as much as you want to talk about. Yeah, so I learned this um, a handful of days after Phil died. So I was dealing with a lot, obviously. Um, you know, I'm in the middle of planning a memorial and making arrangements and just dealing with the trauma and shock and um, sort of blankness. I was spending a lot of time staring at the walls and not talking. And, you know, it was obviously a very sensitive time. And somewhere around day five or six, I learned this because I had called the banks um, to notify them of his death, mostly because things like our mortgage payment and our joint credit cards, they were all on auto pay from this one account that basically funded our entire life and living expenses. And I was worried um, that something wouldn't continue to work. Like I, I knew I had to notify these places. And so I did. And when I did that, Charles Schwab you know, they told me that that account didn't have a beneficiary. And I had this really like, oh gosh, moment. Okay. And then through some some Googling that they sort of led me to is where I learned about the intestate guidelines and that this meant that legally his parents would have a claim to a portion of that money. In the beginning, I, I didn't think they would take it. I, I genuinely didn't. Everyone was, you know, when I say everyone, I mean like people at Schwab and, and the probate attorney and whatever, they were like, well, this was obviously just an oversight. You know, you, Phil and I had actually talked many times about the fact that it was our belief that if something happened to one of us, everything would go to the other. Like we thought mm -hmm. being married was a protection in and of itself. Um, and so learning this was really jarring and, and I was scared. And then I was like, okay, well, they're not actually going to take this are they you know so i knew i had to let them know um or they would be automatically notified by the court by probate court they would get a letter in the mail that's like you know as a legal beneficiary to this estate like blah blah that would give them some information and i didn't want them to hear that way so i had a conversation with one of his parents um at his at phil's memorial actually and that wasn't when or where I wanted to do it, but um, none of us live in the same town. So everyone had come to town for this event and I didn't know when I would see them again and I would rather do it in person than over the phone. So I sat down and, you know, to the best I could, given my emotional state that day, I kind of explained the situation and I was careful to clarify, you know, this isn't money that was willed to you in any way, um, but you're going to get this letter in the mail and this is what's going on. And that parent, they said to me, um, this is the way I remember the conversation. They said, you know, Amy, I want what Phil would want. And you're the best person to know what that is. So if you think this money should stay with you, then that's what I want to. And I was so, so, so relieved to hear that. It was just, it was a weight off my mind. Um, 
And I actually asked that parent's assistance in talking with the other parent and letting them know because I was kind of closer with one than the other. And so that's how that situation was left. This was mid-October. And then later on in December, I got notified through my attorney that they had retained counsel um, and that they intended to take the money. Hmm. Did you ever personally talk to them after this to ask them what happened or clarification? That's uh, quite the turn in to not even contact you. Ah, here's my lawyer. Yeah, there was there was one interim step, actually, that um, they had reached out and asked for information about how much was in this account. So in the beginning, they didn't know anything about how much was in the account. And then they got the information and found out how much money there really was. And that's when they decided to take it. And so I did write a letter. Um, and I considered not doing it because I'm sure you can imagine the swirl of emotions here. Like these are people who I had previously had good relationships with. And they were also like, you know, the strongest remaining links to my husband. And I just had such a hard time fathoming what they were doing and understanding how the logic of this could possibly add up. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write this letter. Um, so at least I'll know that I did all I could to, you know, I thought maybe they just don't understand. Like maybe they don't get it. So I wrote this letter. It's about a page and a half. And um, I kind of gave a brief history of our financial situation, the way that we had had separate finances, the way that it had ended up that this account didn't have my name on it, um, how we handled money, how we planned for retirement, our, our financial independence journey, and how we treated money like a resource that needed to mostly stay in the bank so we could live off of it. And I didn't use the term 4% rule, but I did basically use it as an example. I said, you know, for every 100000 in the bank, that's $4,000 a year. That's our income. And that's what this money is for. So I sent that letter off. Um, I got a response from one of them. The other one never wrote anything. And the one who did respond uh, gave some reasons that uh, didn't, didn't really add up for me having to do with parents uh, being taken care of by their children and I you know it was really hard to reconcile that and still is to be honest I read that letter twice and I put it away and I haven't looked at it since so just to clarify both parents took the full amount yes they're divorced um, but they ended up you know working together they shared an attorney you know they live in separate states but they it's it felt to me like they had been in touch and maybe decided this together. And one of the things mentioned in the letter, um, actually, no, I, I won't quite go there, but a concern I have or that I still think about as a, a financially independent person is ha how our approach to life and to money is so different from most people's that I think an outside person who isn't super familiar with it just looks at that and is like, oh, you have seven figures, you know, in this account. Like, yeah, you don't need it all. It doesn't matter if I take a chunk. But to us, it, it really does matter a lot. Like that makes a really big difference to our bottom line on a year to year basis um, if six figures is walking out of our accounts in this way. So I don't know how much of it is just a lack of understanding um, around, around that. I think there might be a piece. And again, this is just my own imaginings. This is my own speculation, but I could see a scenario where they could be like, well, you're, you know, you're not even 40 yet. You don't deserve to be retired. Like we're older, like we've worked, we raised him, whatever. Um, why should you get to just not work now? But it's like, well, because that's what we worked for. That was our plan. This is what Phil and I built. This is what we intended to do. Um, we accepted all the risk that helped accumulate that money, whether it was, you know, making changes to new jobs or risk in the stock market, those kinds of things. And we also um, didn't spend nearly as much as we could have all along, right? Like we could have been living it up. We could have lived in a mansion. We could have done all these things. And we, we sacrificed some of those options in service to this greater, larger goal that they then got to, you know, take away a piece of. Doug, I've thought about this a little bit with my own family, and you like to think, uh, I only have one surviving parent, as do you, and in my mind, I think there's no way my mother would go after this, and I don't think she would, but maybe this 
Amy, maybe this would be a good thing for you to comment on. Did you think there was any chance they would take it? And then, Doug, I'd like to know if you've considered mm-hmm. this scenario. You know, in the beginning, I thought, no way, no how, they would never. And after considering it a little more, you know, their financial situations are a bit different between the two of the parents. And I thought that it was possible that one of them might um, and that the other one wouldn't. And uh, obviously, I turned out to be wrong on both those counts. But when I think of it now, I'm I'm still incredibly shocked that that they would feel entitled to it. I mean, obviously, they were legally entitled to it per the state of Colorado, but I was extremely shocked and I remain shocked. And and honestly, the word that comes to mind the most is is disgusting. Mm-hmm. And I know that's a really harsh word, um, and it it pains me to say that and to think that about them, but that's how I look at it. Before I answer, I'm I'm curious, do you have any idea why the law is still in the books? It seems like an antiquated, not that there aren't a lot of shitty laws that are still around, but do do you know any of the history of why this law is in place? You know, I don't. Um, I do know that it varies slightly from state to state. And so throughout our marriage, we lived in three states. We lived in Michigan, we lived in California, and we lived in Colorado. And in all three of those states, this would have turned out significantly differently, um, for better or for worse. So if we had been in Michigan when this happens, um, I believe there, I don't have it in front of me, but that the spouse is entitled to the first 150,000 and then 75% of what remains. So I would have been in a a more precarious position. In California, which is a community property state when it comes to marriage, um, almost everything would have remained with me, um, except possibly what could be proven that he had accumulated before our marriage, which was fairly negligible in terms of, you know, comparing it to our overall net worth at this time. Some states, everything does go to the spouse. And even if there are living parents, they're not in the picture. I think Florida is one of those states. So it really is different um, everywhere. Wow. And to go back to your question, Carl, I never thought of it before until this situation happened and it came to light because I thought it was, you know, how you described Amy, like in Florida, where, you know, pretty much if you're married, your spouse gets everything. Um, But now that I have thought about it, I was like, well, shit, I don't know. Because like, if people see the amount of money and they're like, you're pretty young, Maybe they would be like, fuck it. Yeah, I'll I'll take that money. Um, Legally, it's mine. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I hope, hopefully, my uh, in laws or dad doesn't listen to the show. I don't think they do. It it is quite shocking that the parents are entitled to some of it. Like after a marriage, you think that tie is kind of severed, at least in that respect. So, Mm -hmm. I had no idea laws like this existed before this happened either. It's crazy. Yeah. Same. And I've thought sometimes like, you know, maybe it would make sense to put some sort of thing on there about the longevity of your marriage. Like if you had been married for two months in a shotgun wedding or something, do I see that as maybe being a little different? Yes. Um, but like we're married for nine years. I mean, that's not, that's like we have made and we're continuing to make a life together. We were each other's primary person. Like I mm-hmm. think the, the word severing, Carl, that you use is an interesting one. I think that's true. Like we become adults and we transition from our parents being our primary supports and people to our spouse. And um, in this case, anyway, the law didn't quite catch up. And I'm just curious about the time frame a little bit. So um, can you run it down just sort of beginning to end and when it was closed out and everything? Sure. Yeah. So um, he died in mid-September of 21. Uh, The memorial where I had that conversation I mentioned with this parent where I let them know that this was coming, uh, that was in mid-October of that year. In December, they retained counsel and declared their intention to take the money. Um, And then the Colorado law says that an estate must stay open for a minimum of six months. And I'm not sure of all the reasons behind it, but that's how it is. So at the time, I thought like, okay, well, we'll get through this in six months and it'll all be over. But that didn't turn out to be the case. There was like hurdle after hurdle. Um, So the upshot is that 
the major distributions from the estate account where both I and the parents got like most of the money coming to us. That didn't take place until late December of 2022. So it was more than a year after he died. And the money, I was the executor of the estate, but you know, I have a fiduciary responsibility. I could not use that money to live off of. You know, I could use it to pay certain things like for the memorial and for legal fees, but that wasn't an asset that I could you know, touch for just cash flow and paying the mortgage and like paying bills and stuff like that. So I had to, you know, jigger some things around with my other assets um, to make things work. So in late December, the bulk of the distributions were made, but the estate actually has to file a tax return for 2022. Um, So my accountant or the account for the estate is working on that now. And so the estate is actually not totally finished or closed. We held back a certain amount um, in order to pay taxes and to pay final legal fees and that sort of thing. And the return is being prepared now. And once that happens, you know, if it's owed money or if it has to pay money, that'll take place. And then of what remains, that will be distributed, you know, along these percentage guidelines um, between the parents and me. And then it will finally be able to be closed. So we're more than a year and a half now after his death, and it's still not quite here, the end. Wow. That's surprising. I thought it would have been a little fast. I didn't think about the tax implications. So it'll still be like a couple months, maybe, like if they're maybe preparing the taxes. Yeah. Um, I got an email from my accountant last week. You know, they're working on it. They actually were waiting on some information from the parents because as beneficiaries, they needed their socials in order to file this return. So that all goes through the lawyers because I'm not in contact with the parents. And um, so, yeah, maybe a couple months if I'm lucky, but I've thought that so many times before, like, oh, we're so close. Oh, you know, we should be able to close it up anytime. And so I'm kind of not counting my chickens quite yet. And so this all sounds like a huge pain in the ass and a lot more stressful than it needed to be. And it was already going to be very stressful anyway. How did you feel along the way? It's probably been a roller coaster ride. Um Kind of an open question, but I'm just curious, like how it's been going. Yeah, um, a roller coaster is a good word to use. Um, when I first learned that they were taking the money, you know, the primary emotion is just one of such terrible betrayal, not just of me, but of Phil, of their son. Um, in this letter that I mentioned, I had written to them the fact that we had had many conversations where we. Uh, talked about the fact that we believed in the event of one of our deaths, everything would be fine because it would stay with each other. So when I think about them getting that letter and reading that and taking the money anyway, I, I think about two scenarios. Either they didn't believe me or they did believe me and they did it anyway. Neither of those are great, right? Like they can not believe me if they want, but they weren't there. Um, so it just is what it is and there's nothing I can do. But betrayal is the biggest feeling that comes to mind. And then this, the next one is really, it's, it's more loss. Um, I think it's possible that a bigger person could have experienced this with them and could still maintain a relationship and keep them in their life. I don't feel that way. I don't know how I could go forward with them given the fact that they made this choice. So to me, It's just like loss piled on top of loss. We were all, all three of us, already experiencing the absolute worst tragedy of our lives. And there were very few things that could have happened that could have made that worse, but they made it worse. I know that's very heavy. I know this is usually a funny (laughs) podcast. You can make some jokes if you want. What a downer, Amy. I know. know. (laughs) We're sorry that you went through. Thank you. Thank you. And- It's been really validating to have conversations like this because when I mention this to people, whether it's friends or strangers I meet on airplanes or podcast hosts, the response has been thus far, at least to my face, pretty universally like, oh my gosh, really? Like not only was this possible, but they actually did it. And that helps me because often, you know, when I'm alone in my house now and I'm just brooding or ruminating or grieving or crying or whatever, I often, you know, I second guess myself and I think like, am I crazy? Did I imagine this? Like, what? am I being irrational? Um, so it helps when I talk to people and they're like, oh my gosh, wow, I can't believe it. 
Yeah, I can't. Just thinking through your situation, if there was a very, and I'm just coming up with this right now off the top of my head, maybe if if they had undergone severe financial burden to bring up Phil, maybe they sent him to a college that cost $300,000, maybe they could have had a little bit of a case, but even then they could have reasoned with you, hey, Amy, we went through severe financial whatever to raise Phil. Um, we're not going to go through the legal process to take the money, but to help us out, maybe you could help us out, help us out a little bit. I don't think there's any justification for what they did. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't have kids, right? So I can't pretend to know what they're going through as a parent losing an adult son, and for one of them, their only child. And I don't pretend to understand that. Like, I, I can't um, at all. But I also can't understand the mental gymnastics required to justify um, thinking that you as a parent would be entitled to, to this piece of, of money that your son and his wife, you know, saved up and built together. It's a really tricky logical puzzle. Yeah. So how could all of this have been avoided? Yeah, <laughs> that's the million dollar question. Um, so there's a few things. Uh, one is the the beneficiary designation we were chatting about. Um, and Doug, you mentioned that, you know, with your bank, they actually wouldn't let you designate a beneficiary. And I don't know if that was the case here, but I do know that now as a person who's very aware of this and has thus like buttoned up my own estate very neatly and tidily, um, I do have beneficiaries designated for everything, including, you know, after tax brokerage accounts. So like I mentioned before, beneficiaries will supersede a will. So not only do you need to designate your beneficiaries correctly, but you should really go back and look at all of your accounts and make sure you don't have an old designation on there that you want to change. Like that's a, a common and dangerous thing especially when we're talking in the financial independence space and you might have some pretty large accounts out there. You know, it's a, a big deal. So the next sort of level of defense is wills and trusts. Especially um, if you're on the FI path, a trust is pretty appropriate um, and stronger than a will in many cases. You know, even if you want to maintain separate assets from your spouse, you can make it so that the trust is the beneficiary and that your spouse is the other trustee so that everything ultimately goes to them. So there's lots of different ways you can do it, um, but there's also other questions that didn't turn out to be relevant for us, but that easily could be relevant, and that's things like a medical power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Um, so if you're incapacitated, you need someone to look after your financial affairs. They may still need to like pay your bills or whatever, so you need to have something in place that enables them to do that. And you know, similarly, if you're incapacitated and you need medical decisions made on your behalf, you know, if you're married, that is your spouse. But if you're not married, um, you need to figure that out and pick someone and communicate with them. And you need to document all of this and put it in a safe place. So right now I have a really fat binder that is in my safe at home. And um, at least one other person has the code to that safe and is also the same person who's, you know, empowered to do many of these things on my behalf. And so these are some of the steps you can take to prevent a situation like this from happening to you. Do you have a trust set up as well? I do. Okay. Yes. Can you talk about the process for that? It sounds complicated. Yeah. So um, after Phil died, I he had managed our investments for basically our entire marriage. I mean, I'm fairly educated in, you know, index funds and the 4% rule and that sort of thing. But the actual like mechanics of doing it, especially when we were spread across so many different accounts at different financial institutions and different names, whatever, um, he had the, the bigger picture on that. And so when he died, I felt very vulnerable and very ill-equipped, um, you know, due to my just compromised state at that time to take that over. So I started working with a financial advisement firm. And they were really a game changer for me and they assisted in the setup of the trust. It was a situation where if you have a certain amount of assets under management with that, they kind of throw in the whole estate and trust planning piece. So they had in-house attorneys that I worked with and there was like a, okay, you know, say you die, what do you, who do you want to get what? And you can do it in percentages or dollar amounts. I think in my particular case, 
there's three or four different individuals or entities that are getting like just a certain dollar amount. Um, and then after that, it's mostly percentages. So like, okay, after that, what's left is, you know, 10% goes to this person, 10% goes to this person and on and on. Um, so the process of setting that up, it actually, it took a little longer than I thought, you know, it, there's a lot of like legalese and the lawyer handled most of it, but I had to have several calls with them that were an hour or so in length that was like, okay, this is what we're doing, you know? And then you're also tackling the medical directives, um, some of which are, you know, describing like, you know, how long you want to be on life support in the event of all brain activity ceasing. You know, it can get pretty granular, but they have all these templates, right? So you just kind of tell them, okay, I want to take care of the medical stuff and the financial stuff and whatever. And then they're like, okay, these are the papers. Let's start working out who you want to do it with. And they have it on file and I have a paper copy. Um, and you know, I feel, I feel safe now knowing that those things are in place. Cool. Uh, Doug, who did you go through to get your will together? Elizabeth had a, a benefit for some legal stuff at work. And I think it was like relatively cheap. It's like 10 bucks a month or something like that. So they had, um, I think a pretty standard form. Elizabeth had a meeting, but we had, it's a very simple will. Um, some of the other forms, uh, same deal. It was just kind of, uh, it looked pretty vanilla to me. So yeah. nothing complicated under the trust. I think, um, we talked to Amberly a couple, uh, months ago and I think she had one set up. Maybe it costs like 750 to a thousand dollars to have a trust set up. So that'll be the next step. And I think, um, well, Amy, maybe you could, uh, expand on it. You said, a trust is going to give a little more power than a will. Uh, do you know why? Like, why why is it better or more uh, versatile? That's a great question. Um, I know you can get more specific with a trust. So something that comes to mind for me. So, for example, many of my beneficiaries are relatives who are minors, you know, like nieces that I have. And I didn't want to have a situation where, like, I die and they're, you know, really young and they get all this money with no restrictions whatsoever. Like that doesn't seem like a healthy situation, even if they're over 18, but I don't want to hand an 18 year old, you know, a, a giant pile of money. Like, I don't think that would be good for them. So with a trust, you have the option to be like, okay, well, you get this much at this age and then this much, you know, five years later, maybe, or you can set it up so that it can be used for only certain things like education or housing, but they can't like go buy a Lamborghini or whatever. So it allows a little bit more control, um, whereas a will does not give you those options. Got it. Doug, if you would like to buy me a Lamborghini in your will, I would, or a right. Ferrari, I'd, I'd be yeah. okay with that. Or a Corvette if you don't want to spend Italian sports car money. But does, does Georgie the dog get all of your assets? She's in there. She's in there. Yeah. There's some restrictions on what she could buy as well. Yeah. <laughs> don't want Georgie to go buy a Lamborghini or Dog biscuits. She's like buying all these biscuits. It's like, why? <laughs> How did this order come in for like 5,000 pounds or tons of biscuits? Chewy.com is really <laughs> yeah. making bank off you guys. Yeah. It's like but, Georgie Cunnington. It's like, who is this account? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, in my own trust, I did make provision for my cat, um, which at the time I actually had two cats at the time I set it up, but now I just have one. And it's a, a small percentage. And then there's a list of people who I would want her to be offered to. And then whoever takes her will get a certain amount of money per month. Um, so, like, I know this is, like, full-on, like, eccentric cat lady uh, <laughs> kind of behavior. But yeah. it was a real concern for me. Like, what would happen to my kitty if I died? Like, I don't want her to be, you know, sent to a shelter or put right. down. That would be horrible. So. Yeah. She's provided for. Yeah. Georgie is in our will too. And it, it, it's not, uh, we didn't, we don't have a trust set up yet, but it'll be a similar elaborate situation. It's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, it's a perfect situation it's to real, take care of. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So you, you got to set up a trust, right? Yeah. So, I'm going to do all of this and I'm going to try to find something crazy to do with my money too. Like the library has to, like I'll fund a new wing of the library and I don't want it to be named after me. I don't want my name on anything, but they'll 
It'll have to have like a fiberglass dinosaur on the roof for like in the lobby. I'll put some provision in there like, hey, you can have this two million and all you have to do is have this neon dinosaur in the lobby <laughs> or some crazy yeah. thing. Let, it's let, like let me know if you have any ideas. Decorated per season. That would be good. Yeah, that would yeah. be awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. All right. Any Anything else that we need to cover that we haven't um, gotten into here? Let's see. Anything else you could think of, Amy? I guess the thing I would add is that, um, you know, I talked a little bit about the loss of the relationships with his parents and how impactful that's been. Uh, but a sort of stickier or more gray area has been the extended family in some cases, because I, you know, my links to them are gone, whether it's Phil himself or Phil's parents. So there's lots of, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins that I previously had lovely relationships with. And I don't know how many of them, if any, know that this has occurred at all. So what it may look like to them is that, you know, Amy dropped out of the family and stopped showing up and didn't come to, you know, this wedding or this funeral or whatever. And, you know, I guess she dropped us. And I worry a lot about, you know, what how that feels or how that looks and and maybe I shouldn't and I worry if I should tell them what's going on and that's hard to do with relatives you're not super close with and and it also I think maybe forces them to choose uh either their you know brother or sister or whatever and like of course they're going to you know side with them if sides must be taken and maybe I would do the same if it was my brother but it has it has felt like a large additional loss and just been a really, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing in, in not speaking up or in not providing a lot of details. There was a funeral that came up, um, in Phil's family. And I, I was thinking about going and then, um, some members of the family reached out and specifically asked me not to. And I was told that my presence would cause a lot of pain and consternation. And that was a really, really big blow. Um, and the way they outlined it is because his parent was going to be there and it wouldn't be fair um, for that parent to have to see me, I guess. I, I'm not sure. And they wanted the focus to be on the person who had died and, and their loved ones, which I understand. Uh, but it was still a really intense thing to be told. So I know that's also a really downer point to end on, but it's it's a thing that is the thing that I am struggling with the most. Like the parents, I sort of, it's really sad, but I kind of consider that chapter kind of closed and gone. The rest of the family members, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that, but I, I don't know how to navigate these next steps, you know? So that's really hard. Well, two points uh, through this podcast and others, you might be surprised who will find out and the truth will surface. And Maybe they'll have a different opinion after that, but the the really good thing is much more than that is you being on here and sharing this. I, I don't think most people are going to take action on the stuff we do, Doug, which is probably a good thing for them. They shouldn't buy any of our merchandise. <laughs> uh, they shouldn't do the things we do or take after us. But this, I, I know people are going to hear this episode and take action because of it. Mm -hmm. And. Quick note, I mean, check your uh, each state or whatever, but in Colorado, we were able to like get a template for a will, fill it out or whatever, and then we just had two witnesses that had to sign as well, and that's it. That's that's all we had to do. It was not super complicated, and it would have alleviated you know the situation that you went through. Um, some of the other forms, they have to be notarized. Things are a little bit more a uh, pain in the ass, but I mean, still like it's, it's all doable, but some of it is like easily doable if you just have a couple people to watch you sign the document. Yeah. At that and the updating of the beneficiaries, like you can log into your Chase account or your Fidelity right. or whatever right now and check that and make sure it reflects what you want it to be. So that's the action that I hope people take at a minimum. After right. hearing this. Yeah. And I'm actually going to double check my beneficiary thing. Like we, we should be covered, but it seems like I'm surprised that I ran into the issue. So I'm going to double check and make sure I just didn't miss it or something like that. Good. So, okay. Amy, this has been great. Thanks for sharing your story. Are you online anywhere? Do you want people to follow you or are you just kind of doing your own thing and living your life? 
Yeah, I do have um, an Instagram and a Twitter that I just very recently started that in both cases is at widow and then. Okay. Um, and I'm just intending to share things like this interview there or possibly other grief resources down the line. Cool. Yeah, we'll link up in the description. And you're occasionally, I hope it's okay that I mentioned this, occasionally you show up at uh, some of the Mr. Money Mustache HQ events. Uh, sometimes there's meetup stuff. So you're around every now and then, right? Yeah, I'm around. And if people, you know, um, I'm always interested in meeting other widowed people, to be honest, that are local, especially, but even just in general. So if people want to reach out, um, the 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 overlap of the FI space and the widow space is like very, very tiny. So when I find people who may be in that space, I'm like, hey, let's be friends because we can understand things about each other's lives that almost nobody else will. So if there's any folks like that who want to reach out, please do. All right. Thanks, Amy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast and I'm Doug Cunnington, the Balder host. And Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five. And uh, actually, we don't give high fives in, in person. So the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. Amy, when did you get into growing pumpkins? I think it was around 2015 when... I bought pumpkins that year from Trader Joe's for decoration. And when they were rotting at the end of the season, threw them out back. And um, and the next spring, some plants came up. And it was like, oh, these are the pumpkins, right? Okay, let's see what happens. And we got around six or seven jack-o'-lanterns that year. Wow. How big were those pumpkins? Were they just like the little guys? or like No, the they were like the like a one you would carve kind wow. of size. Yeah. It, so you just tossed them out and then they grew naturally. Yeah. When did you realize that they were the pumpkins? Um, Pretty early on. It was a section of the garden that we hadn't thrown anything else into. So it was kind of like, and I think you could still see some of like the pumpkin carcasses in some spots. So it was like, okay, you know, we thought we were composting them and we were, but we were composting them as it turns out into whole new pumpkin plants. Okay. And then what happened? Because I, I kind of remember that you gave us like eight pumpkins of different varieties last fall. Yeah. So that year was the beginning. And then every year there, thereafter, um, the, the pumpkin obsession sort of grew. So I really love fall and pumpkins are a harbinger of fall. So I just, I really loved having them around. And I felt like by starting to grow them, you know, they go in the ground in mid-May or early June. So it felt like I was extending fall. You know, I was able to like interact with the pumpkins and have them in my life like for so many more months. So um, at the time we lived on three acres in Michigan and there was a lot of space to play with and we didn't plant three acres of pumpkins. That would be insane. <laughs> but we had space to make a pretty large patch. And I think the biggest yield I had in Michigan was around 250. Um, and then we spent a year in San Francisco where I couldn't grow any and that was really sad. And I like I stocked up at Trader Joe's that year and tried to like bring fall into the house, <laughs> even though fall in San Francisco basically doesn't exist. And then here in Longmont, um, I think my two years are both in the mid 300s in terms of my yields. And I expanded to many different varieties. A lot of them are small. Some are big, different colors, the kind that are like lumpy and have warts on them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a lot.
I have a couple follow-up questions. You mentioned you lived in San Francisco, and I'm thinking of a Japan situation. Do they have any kind of apartment pumpkin, like a mini pumpkin you can grow in a pot that's like four inches, a cube of four inches? Um, Not that small. The best you could do, which I did consider, is you could get one of those like really big pots that you might put on your patio, you know, from Lowe's or something. And you, there are some varieties that might do okay in there of the smaller pumpkins specifically. And they're more of a bushy plant instead of a vining one. So you could do that on a deck or a balcony or a roof. Um, I never did that because the logistics of doing it, we didn't have a car there. So it's like, okay, I would have to haul all the soil to fill that pot up to the roof of my building. Like it was just kind of too much. So okay. I didn't try and my follow-up question, going to the other end of the spectrum, I'm sure you've read about those contests where they grow a pumpkin the size of a Honda Fit. Uh, instead of growing 250, Amy, why don't you get some, I don't know how they do that, if they uh, put some radioactive material or some serious fertilizer, but you should do one of those, like one that would take up your entire backyard. It would be as big as your house. Have you ever considered growing just a massive, big-ass pumpkin. Yeah, uh, considered it. Phil was actually really into that idea and wanted to do that one year. And we were like, yeah, okay, we'll do that eventually. Um, but it takes a lot of babying. In particular, you don't want those to grow too fast because their skin, their shell will crack. And that like negates the whole thing. It'll rot from there. You can't salvage it. I've actually had that happen with pumpkins that are just like maybe, I don't know, 30 inches across. Like If they grow too fast, that'll happen. And you have to shade them, the fruit itself. You don't want them sitting on the ground because of rotting. So maybe you're using pallets. And then the question is, okay, well, when it's done and it's 500, 1,000 pounds, like if you're a real farmer and you're entering that into a county fair, you have a crane and a tractor and you're transporting that. But like, we don't have a crane. I don't have a crane or a tractor. What am I going to do with it? The only choice would be to like chop it up in the yard. And that's just sort of sad. Like why grow it to do that? So that's why that hasn't happened yet. I volunteer the trailer that we have at the HQ. We might have to go rent some kind of device, a forklift or skid mm -hmm. steer. But yeah, if you ever get around to it, let us know and we're here for you. <laughs> so what's the biggest pumpkin that you've grown? Honestly, I haven't really kept track. Not that big. I think 30 inches and, you know, maybe around 60 pounds is the biggest that I've gotten. Okay. Um and I don't honestly, I don't know if thirty inches is even right. I'm really bad at guessing measurements like that. Sure, but you know, yay yeah, me. okay. For the listener, she's holding her arms out, it's like, like a in beach a circle. ball. Yeah, like if you carry if you carried it, that was a, that's about as big as you can, like yes. wrangle. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wrangling size is what they call that. Pumpkin wrangler. That's my new job <laughs> title. <laughs> 